and we are back. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Adam. Hey, thanks, mate. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. All right, this is on. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this talk is about um, how we as engineers can reach out to a number of colleagues in a traditional uh, federal uh, like defense contractor um, to really help wrangle compliance in a reasonable manner. Uh, it's a daunting task, a, work on two, uh, a war on two fronts at least. Um, but what we'll see is that a lot of organizations already have the fundamentals uh, already in place. Um, once that's understood... Among or uh, across the organization, um, I think some documentation, a little bit of process improvement here and there, and metrics um, can exceed uh, compliance and even make security a business enabler. Um, it's security to make the CFO happy. I don't think it would be a DEF CON talk without some colorful language, uh, so I'm going to hit you right up front. There it is. So just by quick show. Yeah, look at that. That is some raunchy technical gibberish there. So uh, real quick, I'm sure most of you are familiar with some of these terms, but a line by line. So basically the top one security controls. Uh, the next one is DOD standards for training. Uh, the next one is how organizations are supposed to protect uh, controlled unclassified information. Um, the next one is how um, the Department of Defense has so many DEF CON groups that they go with entire phone numbers, just not the trunk. Um, just kidding. That DFARS clause is what folks in our contracting uh, departments are, or maybe even legal um, are going to use to trace when standards actually go into uh, contracts as they go out to the federal contractors. Uh, and then last week, we have two uh, maturity models from the, the kind of the origin is the Software Engineering Institute in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They are the Capability Maturity Model Integrated and then the uh, cybersecurity maturity model certification, which is currently uh, in development. So whose ears are burning? Uh, Who would be offended by that technical gibberish? Well, it's the entire DOD supply chain for starters. And as you can see, that's quite a few companies. Um, we're here at Hacker Summer Camp. So, um, oh, so um, folks in, that live and breathe um, business efficiency in, in companies, um, to them, the Department of Defense is the advanced persistent threat, and they are a tough and determined enemy. Um, it's hacker summer camp, so let's do some uh, threat modeling. And we'll start out with our, our targets, or maybe our potential victims, uh, subjects to, to attacks from this, this APT. So uh, business side, we're going to see business development folks. So these are the capture leads trying to capture new business and new customers. And then there's program managers who execute uh, existing contracts. Um, on the uh, internal support functions for a company, we're going to have finance, quality assurance, um, IT managers that um, are, are going to be targeted by these, these uh, new standards and things. All right, so so threat vectors. Um, wh what forms do the threat come? What form do the threats come in? Um, so for the business side, we're going to look at data calls, which are from other companies that want to partner on efforts. Uh, we've got um, requests for information or requests for proposals coming in from customers, and we've got statements of work and supplier statements of work. Um, on the organization side, we have certifications that they may choose to to go out and try to to. Um, get approval for, and then audits from uh, folks like the Defense Contract Management Agency. Um, the third one is kind of a catch-all, and it can hit both the, the support functions and the business, and that's the questionnaire. So why is it so scary um, for these, these company leaders, so these department heads and, and business directors? Um, you know, why would it make the CFO unhappy? Um, and these are a list of, of pain points. So, so poor communication, uh, possibly from business project to business project, as well as poor communication between the customer, so the DOD customer, uh, and the business. Um, the reason for that is that simply it, a lot of times it's a flow down issue from, from the DOD to departments and agencies and so forth down to our program office, and they really don't know how to communicate um, that to the contractor. 
Um, the second thing is the security language. I think literacy is a big issue when we look at the security controls in the NIST, uh, NIST special publications and kind of map that to what we do uh, to, to you know, provide services and systems to, to the government. Um, security that comes in at the end, I would argue, is the classic example of unplanned work, if you're familiar with that term from the from DevOps practices. Um, and lastly, a lot of these mandates and requirements, um, they kind of run counter to traditional uh, contract execution work. Cost schedule and performance count, um, but there's no real way to measure the, you know, how well you did security, right? So they tend to get dropped. Um, and fortunately, that that uh, security is changing with this CMMC, which we'll cover again. Um, so we, we've seen some potential victims in our organization. We know what the threats are. Um, so, so what can we do to help out? Well, first of all, this is supposed to be a picture of we're going to teach the, the victims how to outswim the shark for one. So how do we do security in our process faster uh, and more efficiently, right? Because that's how we know how to do business is to do, do things, you know, on time and, and on budget. It's just familiarity. Um, Secondly, I would argue that um, really wrangling the compliance, you know, not just taking the standards in, at face value with written form, but finding out how they, they apply to us and how we can tailor, uh, tailor them to our processes that, that we have already, how we do things. Um, to be a good lifeguard in your business, um, you have to enjoy working with other people uh, across the organization, uh, especially if there's few security folks in your group. Um, but swimming preferred, but not necessary for this job. We've got a lifeboat. Um, so training is a factor in this talk. Um, one point that I wanted to make is this is kind of the view, view of security right now to a lot of people. You know, you get this one piece of paper, this this uh, authority to operate, this certificate, and people think you're done, and then you know you move on and, and forget about security. So if it's not clear by now, we kind of need to train up to these business leaders to say, you know, this milestone that we're going to, you know, we're going to have this compliance fire drill, um, you know, that's not the end of the day. We want to do this easier the next time and get better and better at it. Um, so there are many maturity models. This one is mine. Um, there, there is no settled on cyber, cybersecurity maturity model yet uh, for the CMMC. Um, there are some out there, but this one's mine. So I would argue that level one is awareness. Security is a thing, and I think most people achieve that because they're afraid of it. Uh, number two is the literacy, so really understanding the documents. Um, once we understand it, we can engage both tactically with our customer and really help them understand because sometimes we may be ahead of the curve in, in kind of knowing, you know, it's our systems, uh, the things that we build. We, we should know how to put security in there the right way. Um, and then strategic, so interacting with uh, things that are ongoing, like the cybersecurity maturity model certification, which um, I think we ju all just missed a listening session um, hosted by NIST like on Thursday. So there's another three or four sessions. If you look at the CMMC website, um, you'll see their schedule they have, what they start this summer. Um, lastly, for our, our purposes, um, security needs to be a measurable cost. Um, and this is a playoff. The CMMC um, their kind of bumper sticker is, is security is they want to make security an allowable cost, which is a change um, from the past. So I say we make it a measurable cost. A history lesson. We are not going to be the first uh, techies to have to work across um, the company um, to, to kind of satisfy uh, process improvement or certification. Um, just a quick reference. This is the information assurance baseline. When we look at the 8570, 8140, um, this is a matrix of various technical and managerial roles uh, and security specific roles. Um, I point put this up here, one, to show that um, while general cert generalist certifications get a bad rap, um, if you don't have a well-defined security group yet, um, the generalist certifications um, give you a lot of bang for your buck to, to kind of get start wrangling compliance. Um, one in particular, the CISSP, I'm not endorsing that one, I'm just saying it it's in a lot of boxes. Uh, next to that, you have Security Plus, and I'll also point out real quick if you can see anyone uh, of the Security Plus, Network Plus. You also have the CE. That's for compute elements. So um, the point there is that you know technical uh, proficiency matters. And as we go to 8140, it seems like it's going to matter more. Um, so 
so how do we get the best uh, value out of our training dollars? Um, uh, so we've been we've been uh, talking about roles in our company, and they tend to be senior, at least senior to me, a mid-level engineer. Um, in triaging security control uh, traceability to various projects, I like to line up what I call compliance dominoes. Um, so if we know the milestones that our customer expects, um, and we, we kind of go to the higher ups, the business directors who have, have visibility across the company, um, let's line up these milestone dates that the customer has uh, with our existing program schedules, right? Uh, too many times I've seen security come in you know, at the end, and it's kind of like getting T-boned in a car accident. You know, The schedules are orthogonal. They're not uh, in lockstep. Um, once we do that, we're definitely going to be more efficient in executing on these security tasks, whether it's a technical hardening effort to, to fix a web server or to you know answer a questionnaire or something like that. Um, the, the next bullet, maximizing existing contracts. I would say that's both um, maximizing uh, the resources we have um, from our customer. We may have to, to uh, pull on them rather you know, rather strongly, maybe even reach through the customer to their their next level up. Um, but they're going to provide valuable guidance, whether they know it or not, on how we we can um, we can do things efficiently. Um, secondly, there's our vendor relationships, um, and that brings me to some of the relationships we'll see on the ground in our company. Um, so the first one is purchasing. So I know in my case, uh, initially, purchasing with the people that maybe I make a purchase request for for some software and maybe I have to wait a long time and eventually it gets approved. Um, and then when I go install the software that I just got approved for, I get to a certain point and ask for a license key. And then I have to go back to that person too because they got the email with the license key. Um, so per the purchasing folks are more than that. They they have the... Um, they have the um, contact with our vendors, um, they're going to help us maximize that relationship to get the most out of our, our SIM or our vulnerability management vendor um, in terms of training and technical support um, and things like that. Um, they're also going to have visibility on what other programs and what other groups have act are actually using the same software, right? Because they'll, they've got basically higher level visibility um, into all the purchases in the company. Um, that's going to save us uh, from making painful decisions about buying a new or opening a new account where we can just get maybe an entitlement with an existing uh, existing account that we already have. And one last thing about purchasing, um, it is a central point of having a good supply chain risk management plan. So I would argue that the purchasing folks, a lot of uh, successful SCRM, which is really about what the, um, the CMMC and some of these standards are about is protecting the supply chain, the, a good program is going to ride on their backs. And those folks are already doing some good work. It's just a matter of them um, maybe adding a little bit there. Um, but they're going to they're gonna help us a lot. Um, the second relationship, um, it should be pretty obvious, but engineering and IT, that's two technical groups, um, should be working together. We might have different tech stacks, but um, otherwise this relationship should make sense. And in the security uh, focus of it, um, I would say, you know, if we can focus on... Um, you know, getting together for some SIM training for that vendor, we haven't really maximized that relationship. That's a really good idea because one, we're going to have more folks to consult on when we're troubleshooting, you know, problems with our SIMs. And the other, uh, the other thing that's just going to bias, if we don't have a SIM yet, um, and we don't really do ma uh, metrics really well, the SIM is going to be that, that data you know, aggregation platform to get metrics. And frankly, as engineering group, if we don't have that yet, it's going to help us up level to like a level um, in terms of the uh, capability maturity to like a level four if we're at a level two or three previously. The third relationship is human resources. Um, I think there's plenty of ways that this one could go. Um, for me personally, uh, what I saw was this kind of value threat here, which is up on the screen now. Um, I had a situation at work where the uh, a data call came in from um, from another partner. Uh, the senior business director saw it. He kind of put out an email with you know HR and some some of the cyber people, and um, you know HR could kind of figure out who had the right cyber certs or experience. You know, we kind of it's kind of like it was kind of like a company resume to be to be frank. Um, 
HR now has that. They can develop some kind of talent ba database so the next time the next data call comes in, it doesn't have to be an email exercise. Um, they can also um, you know, start tweaking their education reimbursement policies to include cyber training. Um, that's a win for HR because the, now they have one more perk to attract new talent. And it's a win for us because it's a way for us to, to basically, you know, with new talent, we get new allies. And if you're the one engineer that was doing security, now you have folks that can, can help you with that. Um, just a quick summary. Um, the CFOs, um, they're about, I would say, uh, you know, time is money, that old cliche. Um, I would say that security literacy saves time. Um, security, especially organizational security, is going to be team effort. Um, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So our existing uh, groups are probably already doing a decent job. It's just about documenting that and maybe refining it um, to the engineering process that we're already, we're already doing. Um, and then lastly, where you want to get to is that security enables quality. It's not just security for its own sake, but um, there are many practices, good security practices that are going to make your engineering process stronger. And that's it. Um, so, like they say, you really do zip through the slides faster than in, in live. So, um, open up to questions now. Any relationships that uh, people want to work on a little bit more? Not personal relationships. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So physical security. So um, when I'm doing security controls like the NIST 800-53, when I say uh, disaster recovery and business continuity, um, that might be the, the CISSP term. But you know what I mean? To me, that seems like that says facilities, right? And then facilities is going to work with IT because if, if you know, power goes out, you know, what kind of ups are they running and stuff like that. So yeah, that's definitely a relationship that's going to extend down. Um, and then with the supply chain, well, on the, the extending relationship, uh, manufacturing or uh, shipping and receiving is definitely going to factor in a supply chain relationship. Uh, say the last part. Like, uh, products, like more than authentication and authorization nowadays. So how do you sell this idea to get the budget deal from the CEO? Oh, so, so one thing I think um, disambiguating IAM is information assurance manager, okay. not identity authentication management. I hope that was maybe not clear. Does that make sense? Um, so, so one thing I, I, I have to admit as a, as a security minded person, sometimes it helps to be just being aware and literate of the security requirements as they come down the pipe or these, these compliance things. You know, it's something to show like, hey, you know, we have programs A, B, C, and D, and we know that we have engineers that, you know, touch the systems that, that require those kind of certs. Um, so one is showing that official compliance. Now, you know, if you want to hear a weird thing about those DOD 8570, that baseline matrix comes from that, but the new standard is 8140, which is not quite done, but they just re, like, relabeled um, 8570 cube to cover 8140. Um, so dealing with those lags sometimes, that's why I say it's um, those DFARS clauses matter because that's when the rubber hit, hits the road for when you actually see um, new security language in, in um, like contract documents. All right, well, that's it. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate your time.